Bad news is back to good news. Markets got the much anticipated labor report today and the numbers were soft. Markets rallied on easing inflation fears, but diving deeper into the report, we need to ask the question, is this a permanent weakening of the US economy and what effect will it have on the longer term trajectory of stocks? And while the markets are gearing up for their next fix on this channel, we tackle the short term and the long term perspectives so you don't get put on the wrong side of the trade. So how should we be positioned in a weakening economy today? We answer that question and look at the probable outcomes of the S&P 500 following a negative April. We're also going to be diving into margins, sentiment, as well as index concentration. 10 companies account for 70% of the gains in the S&P 500 this year. Are the big guys too big? We've got a lot to talk about, so let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the Daily Recap Show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like this video, and leave a comment for the algorithm. Cheers. A very green day across the board today, led by the mega caps, look at Nvidia, Microsoft, Apple, Meta, Amazon. And this was largely on some upbeat or downbeat data, depending on how you want to look at it. Pretty much non-farms came in cool, rate cut expectations got ramped up. And you know, when that happens, that's going to help technology, that's going to help software, that's going to help semiconductors, that's going to help rate sensitive sectors. Look at regional banks, they put up a pretty good day. Look at real estate, they also put up a pretty good day. But you know, it was really led by the mega caps. They were the greenest of the bunch, the rest of the market followed. But Diving into sector composition, we could see semiconductors and technology names along with software names and XLC all put up upward days of 1% and semiconductors 2.6, 2.7 here percent for technology. But we could also saw that they benefited from the rate cut narrative as well as home construction and regional banks, a ton of commercial assets here in regional banks. The second rate cut expectations ran back up. We're going to see upbeat action here in regional banks. But all in all, look at the worst performing S&P 500 sector energy up 0.01%. So a very, very upbeat day and even energy is going to benefit from you know rate cuts coming back on the table or coming on the table earlier simply because you know these companies have a lot of debt and it's just going to make their debt service easier sure the inflation picture doesn't help them quite as much because oil is going to come down and it's a balancing act and that's why they were flat on the day rate cuts help some areas of the business and don't help others and that's why they were pretty much flat but in stocks like itp home construction stuff like uh xlre stuff like technology rate cuts just benefit them immensely and that's why they were super super upbeat today but let's on the charts and talk about the S&P 500. Now a very, very green day here, guys, an immensely green day. You can actually see the S&P 500 up 1.26%, the NASDAQ pretty much up 2%, the Dow Jones gained two, same with the RSP. It's actually up 0.19% in the after hours as well. Mid caps gained, small caps gained, but the real winner was the NASDAQ 100. They really put out the best performing day and it just goes to show the strength of the mega caps as leaders in this market. You know, they're really gonna lead the run forward and then we'll see a lot of these other members follow on the back of that. SPYG, a little bit downbeat in the after hours, but all things considered, you can't deny the fact that that's a very, very green day. We saw yields fell in a very, very significant way. The, you know, the 10 year was down 1.55%. Bonds gained, gold actually lost on the day, silver lost on the day, the DXY lost on the day, oil lost on the day. So commodities got absolutely hit, especially when, you know, the story is weaker jobs. That probably means inflation is cooling. Commodities do well in an inflation heavy environment. And when that's easing, they're not going to do too well both in the longer term and the short term. But looking at the S&P 500, so the labor report dropped and we actually just gapped up and there was a bit of trade below, a bit of trade above, but we closed pretty much in the top one third of the candle. So a green body candle on a gap up, very, very bullish above the 5100 gamma flip zone. And this probably means we're now just gonna buy dip, sell rips all the way to 5200. That's the core gamma resistance strike. And this probably opens up all time highs. And I actually put up a Twitter post. I said, after the Apple uh, news, we're going to all time highs then the labor report dropped and that's very likely what we're going to see right now in the market i think with us making a higher high right here we've put in a low higher lows then we put in a high and we're now making a higher high and actually a close above this high very bullish when you look at it but hopping on the five minute chart let's actually have a look what happened on the day so yeah you can see we gapped up and this is the type of price action you see in positive gamma you see people sell rips buy dips and we just kind of move our way higher. So the reason why we did sell off a bit here was because of the gap. You know, a lot of people just taking their profits, but when you do zoom out, you know, it's actually a very muted range we had relative to a lot of the price action we had in the last couple of days. See right here, let me put this line down, 5,100, okay? This positive gamma, this right here, this is positive gamma. This right here is negative gamma. Look at the volatility compared to this. 
very very muted okay so very very muted day of trade very very upbeat day of trade and i think uh, looking into next week that's the highest the bulls that want to go get 5136 and then we should make our way higher what's the other next line of support here no that's that's really it you know i mean when we look at everything in aggregate compared to the sell down we've just had this is the highest high we've made in a very long while and we can go attack some of these highs next week and i would say that as long as we stay above the 5100 area here in the s p 500 i think we could pull back to 5100 that does leave some room for the bulls and then we can just make our way higher it's not a very very heavy week of data or earnings next week and we do know that when data is not as heavy as it was this week that's always going to favor the bulls despite everything we had this week was a very very heavy week you do have to look at the fact that sure we did open the week here but we did close the week higher despite the volatility that we saw here so what do i expect for next week if we're above 5100 we're just going to make our way to 5200 that is my expectation you know we can use 5100 as support and we're going to move higher i think that's what we're going to see i think that's what the, the data tells us i think even if we do get below the 5100 there's strong support levels all the way here at 5075 and then 5025 for the bulls and the bears have the work cut out for them they really fumble the bag right here this was a reason to continue to take us lower they couldn't the data was on the side of the bulls and now we're moving higher and i do think we're probably going to go get a new all-time highs so or at least go take out some of these highs right here so 5100 all the way to 5200 next week that is the game plan that is what we're going to do. If you didn't buy this dip, you bought into the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And you never want to buy fear. You want to buy S&P 500. Guys, looking at the earnings scorecard, very big developments. We saw this coming. Double-digit growth here for the S&P 500 officially. Now, this is excluding the BMY adjustment as well as energy. 6.9%, nearly 7% growth, all-inclusive. Nearly doubling what analysts thought we were going to do at the start of this earnings season. So it's been a very, very good earnings season so far and on the revenue front things coming slightly as a beat although pretty much in line something that is a little weird this earnings season is the healthcare earnings look at this revenue growth 7.1 percent really upbeat but look at the earnings growth negative 24.4 percent and we're going to talk about why this is a little later on in the video but all in all earnings so far really really good well above expectation but what about margins because earnings is just one piece of the pie s p 500 is currently penciling in 3.5 percent here in net profit margins in q1 2024 this is the blended margin growth by the way in q1 2023 we were penciling in 11.5 and we actually are improving on a quarter over quarter basis here in s p 500 margins but we'll have to see what the rest of earnings season has to bring if we get solid margin improvements like we did in apple with stuff like nvidia we could definitely see this inch up to 11.6 11.7 but as it is right now we're sitting at 11.5 percent here net margins for the s p 500 now looking at it from a sector level we can actually see that the sectors that are improving their margins is actually information technology financials ever so slightly com services utilities and then industrials along with consumer discretionary margins who have decreased is real estate that is crazy that they have 35 percent margins though as well as energy materials and healthcare and that's why we actually saw the huge earnings disparity in healthcare stocks we actually saw seven percent revenue growth negative 25 percent earnings growth and that's because there's been a sharp decline in overall profit margins and the reason why healthcare margins have come under pressure is due to labor costs workforce shortages inflation rising healthcare expenses reduced insurance reimbursements and aging population as well as supply chain shortages now looking at sentiment guys the fear and greed index is solidly here inside the fear section although we have pulled back we were very very close to this level right here yeah at least you know a couple of days ago we are now smack bang in the middle of the fear zone we are actually moving closer to the neutral zone so the market is definitely still fearful but there's not that extreme fear that fear that will lead to capitulation and i don't think that's actually going to happen the markets are looking fairly solid where they are right now now let's talk a bit about seasonality and what we can actually expect for the rest of the year now this is the s p 500 after we have the first negative month following a positive turn of the year hat trick now a positive turn of the year hat trick is when we've had a positive december january and february and then the first negative month that ensues now this negative month can be in april can be in march it can be in july doesn't matter it's just what happens one month three months and six months thereafter now we had a negative month in april that's why we're looking at these stats and you can see one month later essentially the month of may we can expect average returns of 2.54 percent average up years 21 average down years four that's a very very positive hit rate 21 and four three months is 20 and five 4.1 percent 
8.5% return. Six months is 22 and three, crazy. 8.5% returns right there. And you can see extremely outsized returns. And for a lot of the time, at least I would say a quarter of the time, the max drawdown is actually zero. In other words, from the start of the new month, the S&P 500 goes on to rally. And then from there, it never actually is in a drawdown. And that's very, very positive. So risk is skewed to the upside and we want to be long because stats like these are in favor of the bulls. Now let's talk a bit about equity flows and fund flows. We could see here that for this week, equity saw outflows of $1.33 billion. We actually did see a little bit of inflows last week, but we've sort of been teetering between inflows and outflows over the last four to six weeks. And we're having slight outflows this week. And this data is from the 1st of May and then the five trading days that precede that. So what actually are fund managers buying? Well, according to some data here from Deutsche Bank, you can see that the majority of fund managers actually bought technology and then they were also buying industrials. We could see that the biggest sectors this week were actually industrials, technology, and then telecom services in a very, very close third. And then pretty much all the other sectors got sold. But let's actually talk about S&P 500 composition. This is very interesting data. This is the annual S&P 500 contribution of the 10 largest weights during positive performance years. So essentially, how much of the S&P 500 return does the top 10 stocks produce? Now we can see here that in 2023, the S&P 500 returned 24.2. That number doesn't include the dividend though, just for the record. And top 10 as a percentage of the total return, the top 10 stocks returned 68.4% here in 2003. In 2024, you can see we have a 5.6% return in the S&P 500. And the top 10 stocks have produced 76.7% of the total return. And someone's gone ahead and actually shown that this is very similar to the return here in 2007, right before the GFC although we haven't performed quite as well. But let's just be honest, there were some real systematic issues in 2007 relating to the economy and how things were managed. I just don't think we have those same issues here in 2024. We have a different set of issues and that'll cause its own different problems. And I think that's gonna affect different parts of the market than it is the equity market as a whole. Now let's continue talking about the biggest stocks in the world. This right here is market cap shifts in April, 2024 and a snapshot of the world's companies. So very interesting stuff. So essentially how this chart works is where they were positioned and then where they are now and then their market cap gain. So for example, Alphabet was valued at about $1.7 trillion right there, right? And then its market cap actually moved up $138 billion to just over the $2 trillion mark after its earnings. Maybe it was 1.8, 1.9 trillion. Oh, that's 1.5, yeah. So it was at like a, a 1.9 trillion market cap. It moved up to $138 billion in share value. You can actually see Tesla here in April moved up 25 billion. Eli Lilly moved up 3 billion. The biggest loser right now is actually Microsoft. Microsoft has fallen 9% in April, actually gone completely under the radar. It's lost $233 billion of its market cap. And you can go ahead and look at this. Some stocks moved up, some stocks moved down. The blue here indicates that they were actually positive on the year. The red indicates that they're negative return for the year. And this is just the April performance. So very interesting stuff when you look at it as a whole. And when you look at this, you can see the amount of stocks that moved down in April. It's no wonder we had a violently negative April year in 2024, but things are looking a lot better for May. Now let's dive into the economy and talk about non-farms. Guys, so we got NFP, the data was very, very cool, came out really, really soft. We were in a live stream looking at this live, we saw the dollar dump and we saw the S&P 500 absolutely rip after this data. So don't forget to join us in the live streams, but the non-farms came out at 175K. We were expecting 250,000. Average hourly earnings was also soft at 0.2 month over month. And then the year over year figure 3.9%. The unemployment rate is now at 3.9%. We were actually expecting 3.8% for this figure. We did not get that soft data all around. And now we have to start asking the question, are the Fed's hikes gonna finally be felt by the labor market? And is the increased supply in the US labor market via immigration gonna push this up to heights unseen. We're gonna look, are we gonna see maybe 4% plus here in the US unemployment rate? We're yet to see, but the market initially liked these results, but we're gonna see how this pans out next week, week after next, and for the rest of the year in 2024. So what did the NFP print do to rate cut expectations? Well, according to Fed fund rate futures, we can actually see that we're getting the first 25 basis point worth of a rate cut here in September. This was actually 
posted for November. We were always going to get at least one rate cut in 2024. Futures always price that in. The first one was in November. Rate cut expectations have actually moved up to September after that NFP report. And we're going to see how this is going to evolve next week. We can actually see that this just yesterday was 14%. We're now sitting at a 34% expectation of a possible rate cut here in the July period. And we want to see if this changes. But I do think that we definitely will get a rate cut because of this labor report here, either in November, September or July. This is when I think we're going to get our first rate cut. And it does look like odds are more in favor to September. Couple of things, not much has changed on the tape. There's a couple of things that are notable. Look at the amount of negative gamma forming just along the entire tape. We can see it's actually quite significant compared to the last couple of days. It's a smidge bit of negative gamma right here. And that's very telling because we saw the 5,000 strike get built out quite a lot in the last 24 hours. And I think that has to do with a couple of things. I think it's more bullish than it is bearish. A lot of people will see this and be like, whoa, $7.5 billion to hedge the S&P 500 negative gamma, that's so much. It is a lot, yes, but a couple of things. I think a lot of people, a lot of investors, a lot of speculators who, are, who had downside protection are rolling their puts up all the way here to the 5,000 strike. So they've rolled up from 4,800, 4,900 to the 5,000 strike, right? And even above the 5,000 strike, that's why it's so dense right here. That's why we saw the 5,000 strike build up. It's just the most logical level, right? That's why we also saw a little bit of negative gamma right there. Secondly, with more positive gamma coming into the tape, it probably does favor the bulls, especially above the 5,100. And that means you wanna buy dip sell rips to the 5,200 area and you don't really wanna enter shorts below the 5100 area you want to look at the 5000 as a very very strong support tons and tons of support at the strike and we now know why because at the same time that long speculators were moving up the tape to 5200 short siders were actually moving up negative gamma tape from 49 to 5000 they were moving their positions up and that's why we're seeing the action we are in the gamma tape that being said you know the drill we are in positive gamma so buy dips sell rips all the way to 5100. Now let's hop on some charts looking at some seasonality guys. This is the fourth year of the presidential cycle election year and we can actually see that April a negative April, not actually uncommon in an election year. We often do get a negative May as well. We should just look at this little blip here as an opportunity to buy the dip because June, July, August tends to be very, very positive. And actually the rest of the year tends to be quite positive with some minor speed bumps here in September and October. However, what we should be doing based on the bullishness of this year and last year is really positioning ourselves or getting ready to position ourselves for what is going to be a stellar year because I do think the melt up is underway. Something else supporting the melt up thesis is actually global liquidity. We can actually see that global liquidity has been in this turbo puke mode, what they call it, or the red zone. There's been a pullback in liquidity and we sort of seen that pullback since about March. Liquidity has pulled back both here in the United States and and for the eurozone and that has actually coincided with the s p 500 and a bunch of european stocks the cac the fitzy the dax the stock 600 pulling back anywhere from five to seven percent so a garden variety pullback we can actually see that liquidity has actually trothed right here and we are on the up and up the second we get to the bid section we should see further upside in equities in the bond market in risk assets as a whole now let's have a look at some market breath very interesting new lows breath we can actually see that new lows are actually improving across the board and actually getting really worse here in the energy sector. The energy has been the outperformer since March, since we've had that pullback, since we've had that drawdown in liquidity, energy has sort of been the hedge. And we've actually seen stocks at 10 day lows, 20 day lows, 63 day lows. We've actually seen these pull back in both the short term and the medium term. And we still see that the longer term stocks at 126, 250 day lows or six month, 12 month lows are still very, very healthy. So short term, it is a tiny bit messy. That's for sure. In the medium term, things are looking very, very healthy. In the longer term indexes, things are looking very, very good. Now guys, looking at sectors, this is two very, very interesting sector charts I have. This one right here is 2024. It's all of the sectors year to date and their return on a percentage basis. We can see the best performing sector this year so far, XLE followed by communication services, then utilities, financials, and we have the SPY right here. So the blue is sort of value slash cyclical names. The green is just growth sectors and the red 
is defensive sectors. So there's actually a bit of a mix. We have some cyclicals, defensives and growth all participating here in 2024. Very broad market participation. But if we look at 2023, we can see a very clear trend. Growth clearly outperformed. We had a ton of growth indices, the XLK, XLC, XLY. They were the top three performing sectors last year. Then we had the SPY in the middle up 26% in 2023. And then we actually had value cyclicals. We had, you know, XLI, XLI, B and then XLF all return roughly the same. And then below that, we had defensive sectors. So definitely real risk on environment last year. Place to be was growth and then cyclical value and defensive. You didn't really want to be in defensives because look at the XLP, look at utilities. They actually returned negative for the year. Same with energy. But with the broadening scope of the market, there's a lot more sectors to choose from that you can be in. So there's a lot of ways to play the S&P 500 this year. But in 2023, it was growth and just a very interesting chart just to see the evolution of the S&P 500 and its sectors from last year to this year. But if you've made it up until here, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe. Guys, hit the notification bell, like this video and leave a comment. It really helps me out. Cheers.